Okay, folks, lesson number six in our basic Bible comprehension series. I'll take our lesson board off there, take your Bibles with me, turn once again to Romans chapter 15. We're picking it up where we left off last time, and I'm um, still keeping the same, the board behind me looking the exact same way. Eventually it's going to get to the point of being so cluttered that we can't do that. And you may look at it right now and say it's it's in that shape at this present moment, and maybe it is, but uh, if you've been following along, you understand it, and I want the basic issues that are on there to still be on there, and so I don't want to be taking time redrawing things all the, uh, all the time, and so I think we can uh, live with it. Take your Bibles, like I said, and turn to Romans chapter 15. We were looking at two verses last time in which the Apostle Paul, from the perspective of this dispensation of Gentile grace in which we live, looks back and describes some things in connection with time past, looks back and plainly declares once again God's program in Israel being the issue in time past, plainly declares once again the issue concerning his unique and distinctive apostleship and the dispensation of Gentile grace getting in and being brought into connection with God raising him up, but we're focusing especially upon the issue of the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ and the things in the opening chapters of the book of Acts that follow that before Paul was raised up. And we're seeing once again that the Apostle Paul, God through the Apostle, once again, when I, when I say the Apostle Paul, you need to understand and appreciate, of course, that, that he's God's Apostle and that God's speaking through him, just like Paul says to the Corinthians, since you speak, seek a proof of Christ speaking in me. These are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we comment on that once again in connection with the idea of a red letter edition and things along those lines. These, these are Christ's words also. It's not Paul's opinion or anything like that. And when we make an issue out of the Apostle Paul, and as he needs to be made an issue out, we're not magnifying the man. We're not exalting the man or speaking anything special about the man. In fact, when you go through Paul's epistles, as there's one thing the Apostle Paul does every time, God has him speak about himself as that Apostle of the Gentiles. He, he runs himself personally and fleshly in this, in, into the ground. He's the least of all saints, he says, and, and, and this grace is given to him as such. The issue that we're doing once again is that we're magnifying the office. That's what needs to be magnified, and God wants it magnified. God intends it to be magnified. That's what Paul says himself there. In, in Romans chapter 11, as the apostle of Gentiles, I speak to you Gentiles, as the apostle of Gentiles, I magnify mine office. That's what needs to be magnified. God had, God had two men in the, in, in, in the outworking of his plan and purpose magnify their office. And he had them do it because they're the central individuals in his twofold plan and purpose. Those two individuals are Moses and Paul. When you go through the Bible, Genesis through Revelation, there are two great revelators of divine truth, two persons that God has utilized, that he hasn't simply utilized to set forth his word. God used a number of men to do that. But there are two outstanding individuals that God utilized, and as ones through whom his word came, he had them magnify their office. He had them come along and make a big issue out of their office. So much so that he himself spoke of their office and spoke of his word as their word. Those two individuals, once again, are Moses and Paul. That's why that law is commonly called and done so by God himself, by the Lord Jesus Christ himself, as the law of Moses. It wasn't that Moses made it up thought it up, and that he gave it himself. God spoke it through Moses. But because God had Moses magnify his office, that thing's called the law of Moses. That's why when you go through the gospel accounts, the Lord Jesus Christ repeatedly tells unbelieving Israel, what did Moses tell you? Moses gave you the law. Moses gave you circumcision. Moses did this. You sit in Moses' seat. Moses said this. Moses said that. When a Jew spoke of Moses, he wasn't exalting the man over God, but he was recognizing the magnified office that God put Moses in and that the thing that symbolized and stood for God's program with Israel was what came down through Moses. 
There's only one other man in the entire Bible God's done something similar to that with, and that's Paul. Paul was told to magnify his office. You're here in Romans chapter 15. Come down. We're going to look at verse 8 again. But come on down, if you would, for a few minutes to verse uh, 15. Paul says, Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort, as putting you in mind, because of the grace that is given to me of God, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. I have, therefore, whereof I may glory or boast through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me, to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed, through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum I have fully preached the word of the gospel of Christ. Notice once again there, Paul starts on verse 15 saying, I've written unto you more boldly in some sort, and he has, in some sort. And he's talking particularly about what he's doing right now. And what he's been doing about contrasting the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ and who he is. And he's doing that once again because, he, I said, I'm putting you in mind. I'm, I'm reminding you something. Not that Romans ever heard of that before, but it's so critical to understand. And it's going to be assailed by the satanic policy of evil and denied and spoken against. And the whole design behind that is to get a member of the church, the body of Christ, back in Israel's program contrary to the dispensation of grace. And Paul warns about that in chapter 16, the very next chapter, about ones coming in speaking contrary doctrines. And they're part of the satanic policy of evil. And one of the contrary doctrines they're going to speak against is Paul's unique apostleship. They're going to speak things contrary to that. And they're going to speak things contrary about the Lord's earthly ministry. They're going to come along and say, oh, he, just, well, he wasn't a minister, just a minister of the circumcision. He was for the world. He was for us Gentiles too. There's a sense in which the Lord had the world and the Gentiles in view, but not in a dispensation of Gentile grace view. But out there in the fulfillment of God's program with Israel. So Israel could be a blessing to the world and a blessing to the nations in that kingdom. That's entirely different than the dispensation of Gentile grace. When God's dealing with Gentiles in spite of Israel and without his kingdom on this earth. Paul's saying what he's saying here to underscore the reality of the office he possesses and its need for being magnified. And God wants it magnified, and Paul underscores that here. And once again, what I'm saying to you is when, we talk, when, we, when, I, when I make a big issue out of Paul, I'm doing what God tells me to do. I'm doing what's God, what he himself did right here in Romans 15. And just as God made a big issue out of Moses to Israel, he's making a big issue out of Paul to you. Because his word to you is vested in that apostle. As his word to Israel was vested in Moses. We'll finish it off here in Romans 15, or at least in the brief comments we're making in connection with it. He, I'm putting in mind in some sort, he says in verse 15, because of the grace that is given to me of God. It's an expression Paul uses once again to refer to his unique and distinctive apostleship with the mystery of Christ and the dispensation of grace committed to him. If you want any confirmation on that, hold your place here very quickly in Romans 15. Come over with me back to the book of Gal to, uh, Ephesians one more time. Chapter 3. Here he is talking about himself as the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. Verse 1, if you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which has given me to you, Lord, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. And, he, and, he, and, he, and he's ta then he talks about what the mystery is we've, as we've gone over already and we'll go over again in, in, in later lessons here. Come on down to verse 7. Whereof, in connection with this, I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am the less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. When Paul talks about the grace given unto him, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about that special, unique apostleship with the mystery of Christ that God has kept secret since the world began, revealed unto him, and, and, and the dispensation of Gentile grace given to him for us and everything that pertains to it. 
That's what he's talking about. And that's what he's talking about back here in Romans 15 when he says, I want you to be reminded and have it always in your mind about the issue of the grace that's given unto me of God. That I, there it is once again, now verse 16, definition-wise, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. That's who Paul is. He's the minister of Jesus Christ to you. He's your minister. He's, he's the appointed minister of Jesus Christ to you. In view of the fact that the offering up of the Gentiles is what's going on now. That wasn't what was going on time past, though, as we're going to be seeing. It's in view of this now that Paul says, I got every right and should be magnifying my office. Verse 17. I have, therefore, whereof or reason I may glory or boast through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God. He doesn't boast in himself as if he's anything. In fact, you just saw that in Ephesians, he's the least of all saints. Less than the least of all saints, he says. But God has had him boasting in who he is through Jesus Christ. Because what God wants you to know and know unequivocally, without a shadow of a doubt, is where you're supposed to go in the Bible to find out what, where God's talking to you, about you, and what he wants you doing today. And that's through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. That's why you get a passage like this. That's why you get a passage that contrasts the Lord's earthly ministry and his ministry from heaven through Paul. Those are the Lord's two ministries in accordance with God's twofold plan and purpose. I have therefore wherever I may glory through Jesus Christ and those things which pertain to God. And that's what he's doing. That's what we're doing. That's what needs to be done. Well, come back now to the verse 8 here in Romans chapter 15. Before the Lord Jesus Christ unexpectedly came back from heaven, raised up Paul, and sent him out as the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, the Lord's ministry and everything he was doing was as a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. And you can see that there in Romans chapter 15 now, once again in verse 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Once again, now I say that Jesus Christ was. He was. It's not at that right now. The rest of the verses go on like we just read and make that plain and clear that Jesus Christ is now ministering to the Gentiles through the ministry of the Apostle Paul, doing it from heaven through his Apostle of the Gentiles. And you, are, you still got that ministry right now before you're, before you're reading part of it. That ministry is contained in Romans through Philemon. And it's still the ministry of the Apostle Paul as the Apostle of the Gentiles to you in perfection. You've even got a benefit. We won't get into that now, but I simply say that to you. You've even got a benefit in that right now than the people had when Paul was here. That's something you need to appreciate about the model of the written word of God. But anyway, when the Lord Jesus Christ is here, he was that minister of the circumcision. Now Paul goes on there in verse 9 and says, And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written, and then quotes from four prophetic passages. Once again, don't get the idea that the dispensation of Gentile grace is the issue of God dealing with the Gentiles or talking about the Gentiles as if he never spoke about it before. That's not the issue. Or that God's saving Gentiles now and would never even save a Gentile. That's not, that's not the issue of the dispensation of grace. The issue of the dispensation of grace is God's dealing with the Gentiles in spite of and without his program with the nation Israel and has a special program for them with newness and differences and everything to it unheard of and unspoken about before. That's what the dispensation of Gentile grace. Now you, can, you can go back in the Old Testament scriptures, folks, and find the issue of God talking about eventually blessing Gentiles, but through the agency of the nation Israel out there in their kingdom. That's what the, the Abrahamic covenant God made with Abraham calls for that. And in these shall all the families of the world be blessed. 
So it's going to be by Israel being that great nation out here. Not just a nation, but a great nation. The greatness is in the issue of Jehovah dwelling in their midst. And when they function as that great nation, they're designed to bless the world. And that's what Paul refers to here. Jesus Christ, when he was here, was a minister of the circumcision to confirm the promises of the fathers and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy out there. And if you quote, if you read every one of those passages there and, and look at where they come from back in the prophets, the issue is that the Gentiles glorify God for his mercy to them through that literal, physical, Davidic kingdom established on the earth. Verse 9, For this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. Look at the cause there in the signs where that comes from. It's, it's the earthly kingdom established. And again he saith, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. Not in spite of them and not apart from them. That's what's going on today. But with them as they rejoice out there. And again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. Look at the psalm once again there in connection with that. 117th psalm, and look at the issue there. That, 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 that's a Messianic kingdom psalm concerning God reigning on the earth. And again, Isaiah saith, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, and him shall the Gentiles shall they're going to reign over them. They're going to reign through Israel's kingdom out there. That's uh, Isaiah chapter 11 there. Even the curses are moved from the earth on that day. That's, that's, when the, that, that's the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. That's not what's going on today. What's going on today is the offering up of the Gentiles, like Paul says, in spite of Israel's program, with Israel's program suspended and set aside. And the Gentiles being dealt with in an unprophesied, unexpected, and unanticipated manner. That's the dispensation of Gentile grace. Before that came in, though, Jesus Christ was the minister of the circumcision to fulfill Israel's program so they could be the blessing to the world out there the Abrahamic covenant calls for. And that's why I want you to look at this passage again. Not only is this passage once again telling you that the Lord Jesus Christ's earthly ministry was to Israel, just like Paul says in Ephesians 2, that it was part of time past, and we Gentiles were without Christ at that time. But this passage is also telling you that the Lord Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. There were promises that were made unto the fathers way back here, beginning with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, uh, Joshua, uh, Samuel, David, and so forth. There were promises made to them. And when the Lord Jesus Christ was here, he was a minister of the, uh, of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm those things. Why was he confirming them? Notice he wasn't fulfilling them necessarily yet. He was confirming them. Their fulfillment and everything was out there in the last stage of the program. But he was confirming them in the next to the last stage in the program. And the reason why he was doing that was because he was confirming to Israel that the climactic stage in God's dealings with them had arrived. And that's, once again, what the Gospel accounts are all about. The Gospel account, we saw at the beginning of it last time, a connection with the blank page and, and, and of the silence of God and, and, and the things prophesied about the, the days of the Messiah following the silence of God and John the Baptist being the minister, messenger once again who announced that, that the Messiah was, was there. The days of the Messiah are set forth in the prophets once again as the climactic stage in God's program with Israel divided into two parts. They divide into the meek and lowly, part of the Messiah's ministry and his power and great glory part when he, come, when he, when he comes back at the end of that time, at the end of his day of wrath the wrath to come his day of wrath stick that up there the Lord's day of wrath and that's the, that, that's the second half of the days of the Messiah and he comes in power and great glory and establishes that kingdom for Israel. The climactic stage in God's program with Israel is divided into two parts. His meek and lowly, in which he confirms the promises. His power and great glory, in which he fulfills them. And this passage here in Romans chapter 15, the Apostle Paul is looking back there at the Lord's ministry. And he's describing how thing, what things were. But Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision because it was time past and God's program with Israel was in effect. And he was confirming for the, he was for the truth of God and he was confirming the promises made unto the fathers. He was confirming them and he was saying that they were at hand 
And the next issue, if the dispensation of grace had not come in, would have been for him to fulfill them. And for verses 9, 10, 11, and 12 to have come to pass. But God broke off his dealings with Israel with the raising up of the Apostle Paul, and that those the verses we just read, down from verse 15 and following there. And that's the now issue. Verses 8 and, for, down, to, verse eight and down to verse 12 were what was. Verses 13 and following is what's now. Now what we're doing once again is going back to those gospel accounts. And we're going to see the reality of that and appreciate it more and more in those three basic issues we're going to look at, three out of the 40 plus issues I told you we could look at. So let's go back. Come back with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. Here's a passage that makes it plain and clear, folks, that the Lord Jesus Christ was exactly what the Apostle Paul declares him to be, declares him to have been, I should say, a minister of Jesus Christ, a minister of the circumcision, I should say, for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers, and that therefore the dispensation of Gentile grace was not in effect in the Gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew chapter 10, here's what the Lord commissions his 12 apostles. Paul's not one of them, by the way. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the names of the 12 apostles are these, and he lists them there. For time's sake, you understand them. You can go down and read them on your own and everything. And we're going to come back and look at this passage in view of what just said there in verse 1 a little later on about the power he gave them and the reason for that power, what it meant to Israel. But come on down now to verse 12, where he says, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now that's plain and clear, folks. The ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, along with that which he gave to the twelve apostles with him, to function with him, was a ministry that excluded the Gentiles. And not only that, it even excluded the Samaritans. It was only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now you tell me something. I say that rhetorically, of course. How in the world could a dispensation of Gentile grace be in effect when the Gentiles aren't dealt with? Can't be, can it? Obviously not. The Gentiles are not to be dealt with. They're not going to hear the message that the Lord told the twelve to preach. They're not going to hear the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They're not going to be preached to. And neither are the Samaritans going to be preached to. They're like half-breeds. Not perfectly accurate, but good enough for right now to say it that way. They're not going to hear it either. You go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's who you go to. That's who the Twelve's ministry is to, folks. Twelve's ministry isn't to you. And the great commissions, so-called, Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, John 20, Acts chapter 1, don't change that. Now, how in the world can I say that? Because Gentiles are mentioned there, nations are mentioned there, every creature is mentioned I realize that. But you also need to realize that in Luke chapter 24 and Acts chapter 21, there's an order that is given to those commissions. And that when the Lord talked about make disciples of every nation, teaching all nations, going to every creature, going to all nations. He didn't come along and tell them to do that as if there was no difference and both were one. 
He told them to begin in Jerusalem. He told them there's an order in which they're to go. And he also had already told them that they wouldn't be dealing with those Gentiles until he had come back. You're here in Matthew chapter 10. Come on down just for a few verses, if you would. Come on down with me to verse, uh, uh, let's see. Well, let's pick it up down here in verse uh, 14. Well, no, let's, let's, let's shorten it up a little bit here. Come on down all the way to verse uh, 21. He says, And brother shall deliver up brother to death, and the father the, and the father the child. He's talking about what's going to be going on in the day of the Lord's wrath. And the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. That's the fulfillment of Micah chapter 7 talking about that day. And, ye, and he says, Ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. The end of that time once again there. And the salvation is physical salvation, by the way. And when they persecute you in this city, flee unto another. He's just, he's just, he, send, he just sent them out, or the commission just sends them out to go into the very cities of Israel. Flee unto another, he says. He says, for verily I say unto you. Verily, truly. There's no, there's no joke or anything. Because the Lord, Lord never joked. But the verily cause it underscores once again the reality of it, so you should have no doubts about it. Ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. Well, that's unique, isn't it? You shall not have gone over the cities of Israel, he says, till the Son of Man be come. He's given them a commission here once again long before he ends up going away, back to the Father. But he's setting before them the basic doctrinal comprehension they need to understand as a foundation he's going to build upon the rest of his ministry. And he repeats all this, or just about all this, in Matthew 24, just before he goes to the cross. And 40 days later, he departs from them and tells them the days are coming when those things are going to start being fulfilled in order which he gave them to in Matthew 10 and Matthew 24. And when that day of wrath came, they start experiencing all that hatred and everything there and all that persecution. And they'd be going out amongst the cities of Israel, fulfilling their commission. And he says, you won't even cover the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. Well, they're going to cover the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. When are they going to deal with those Gentiles? After he's come. You can't fulfill Matthew 28, 19, and 20 today. You can't fulfill Mark 16, 15, and following today. You can't fulfill Luke 24, 44, and following today. You can't fulfill Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and following today. You can't fulfill those things that are called the Great Commissions today because they don't pertain to today. Now, it's getting ahead of myself. I realize that. But I need to say something along those lines because it's part of appreciating the whole issue of the Apostles' Commission and the fact that mentioning the Gentiles in those commissions at the end of the Lord's earthly ministry doesn't indicate a dispensation of Gentile grace coming in either. Because he wasn't changing the things he said back here in Matthew chapter 10. He was advancing these things, but he wasn't changing them. And he already made it plain and clear that they wouldn't even get out of the cities of Israel and cover them until he came. And if they go to Judah, Jerusalem and Judah, Judea first, then Samaria, then to the uttermost parts of the world, and they're not going to cover the cities of Israel until after he's come, well, when do those others get dealt with? When the kingdom's established. That's why you get passages in the prophets like Zechariah chapter 8, that talk about the Gentiles taking a hold out of the ten, out of ten languages of the Gentiles, of the nations, taking a hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, once that kingdom is established, and saying, we'll go with you, for we've heard God is with you. We've heard Emmanuel, God's with you. We've heard it. You've preached it to us. God's with them how? In a spiritual sense? Oh, he's right there reigning and ruling in Jerusalem. They get dealt with once that king's established. Isn't that what the Abrahamic covenant calls for? 
when they are that great nation, I'll bless them that bless you, and you'll be a blessing to the world. Let the Bible tell you what's going on, folks. And you need that especially back in the Gospel accounts. Let the Bible tell you what's going on. Not theologians, Bible teachers or anything. Don't even let me tell you what's going on. You check it out. And you'll be convinced 100% on, the, on what it says on the page of God's Word. But you'll be honest at the exact same time. And if you can't honestly deal with the plain statements of God's Word, don't you cling to any tradition on the basis of that. Because that's dishonest Bible handling, and that's dishonesty of heart. And your zealousy and your sincerity, no matter what it is, won't cut it when it comes to that. A zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, isn't honorable. And God doesn't like it one bit. And you look at his testimony against Israel in Romans 10 about that, if you need some help on that. And I'm not mad at you when I say that. I'm just both sincere and serious about it. Because it is serious business. Bible study and, and knowing exactly what God says and going by exactly what God says isn't a take it or leave it type thing. And it isn't something that you don't be precise with. It's something that God expects to be exactly precise with. And the only one you ever help out by not being precise is the adversary himself. Sometimes people come along and they say when you're doing things like this, you're splitting hairs and all that business. I'll tell you something, folks, when a Christian or anybody comes along and tells you that and gives you, get that, gives you that as a slam against what you're saying, they're just displaying their own ignorance because the greatest hair splitter in the Bible is God himself. You look at some examples of things back in, in, in God's program in Israel especially, and you look at how he splits hairs. You look at how precise he is in the way in which things were to be done in Israel. You look at how precise he was regarding how a sacrifice was to be performed, and if it wasn't performed properly, how the individual was killed for it. You talk about splitting hairs, God is the greatest hair splitter around. And you and I need to be precise, accurate, circumspect with God's Word. And he doesn't expect you to come along and get a general, quasi-understanding of things. He doesn't expect you to have a verse here, verse there theology. He expects you to have his viewpoint of things and understand what he's doing. When the Lord Jesus Christ told Satan himself, the man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. He said, every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. God says what he means and means what he says, and in his very words is preciseness of expression, accuracy of meaning, And you're supposed to handle his word that way. That's why, a Bible, that's why Bible study with a paraphrase or a loose translation or a, or, or a dynamic translation won't work. Because you're not dealing with every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You're dealing with justy type concepts that oftentimes misconvey what God's saying. Well, I say that to you once again, folks, because you got to deal with what it says here. And you got to realize that when the Lord said, don't go to the Gentiles, he meant it. And to go to a Gentile was disobedient. And that lets you understand and appreciate back at this time in the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, a dispensation of Gentile grace is not in effect. And if you were here on the earth in the Lord's day, he wouldn't have dealt with you. You realize that? He wouldn't have been sent to you, and he wouldn't have dealt with you. Unless you came through the nation he made out of the seed of Abraham. 
And that's different than him dealing with you as a Gentile in this dispensation to grace. You would have had to bless Israel before he'd even listen to you. There are only two accounts, two times in the Lord's earthly ministry ever dealt with a Gentile. One was a woman and one was a man. And he only dealt with them because they blessed Israel and came through his people's mediation. And we'll look at those in just a couple minutes here. But the important thing to get settled here right now is the reality of what the Word of God tells you about what's going on in the Gospel accounts. And that's that a dispensation of Gentile grace is not in effect. Come with me, if you would, over to chapter 15 here in Matthew's Gospel. I just mentioned to you those issues, those two Gentile people God did deal with. I want you to look at those with me, since it's fresh in your mind right now from me having mentioned it. We could look at some other things back there in Matthew 10. But if time permits, and if time permits, we'll do it. But let's come over to Matthew chapter 15. Look with me, if you would, here at verse 21. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast, a Gentile woman, and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. Folks, what goes on right here is the exact opposite of the general portrait that is painted of the Lord Jesus Christ by people who really don't understand what the Bible is saying and sometimes don't even care what it actually says. The Lord Jesus Christ is portrayed today as just opening his hands to everybody when he's here on this earth, having compassion upon everybody and so forth. Here's an example in which a woman had a desperate need, came at him crying, and said, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. And it wasn't even for herself, it was for her daughter's sake. And her daughter wasn't, didn't simply stub her toe or something like that. Her daughter was grievously vexed with a devil. Verse 23, but he answered her not a word. You need to understand why he did that. And you need to come up with some reason for that. When I say it, I don't mean you need to come up with it on your own. You need to understand what the Bible says about that, why that's the case. He wouldn't answer her. And she couldn't get a word out of him. He wasn't paying attention to her. What is he, hard-hearted? Where, where, where is this compassionate Jesus we're told about all the time? You understand how I'm saying that? All I'm simply saying, folks, there's something wrong, and most Christians understand what's going on in the gospel accounts, because something like this flies in the face of the general understanding that they have, and it causes problems for them, and most Christians don't know how to deal with it. And some aren't even honest enough to deal with it. But you can't afford that, and you can't do that. Why didn't he answer her a word? Why wouldn't she, couldn't she even get him to look, to, to look at her, so to speak? And it wasn't only him. Verse 23 says, And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away. For she cried after us. When she couldn't get the Lord to do anything, she went to the twelve. And they didn't want to deal with her. What happened to them? Hadn't they, hadn't they learned, love your neighbor as yourself? They were just following their own master's example. They were being followers of Christ. They were doing what they were just been told to do in Matthew 10. You don't go to a Gentile. You don't even go to a Samaritan. If it's not a member of the lost house of Israel, you don't deal with them, he said. They were following orders. 
and so was he. Look at his answer once again. Verse 24, but he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Who was Jesus Christ sent to? The lost sheep of the house of Israel. Are those Gentiles? No. Does that woman of Canaan qualify? No. If you were living back at that time, would you have qualified? No. Do you like the way that sounds? Probably not. But is that what the Bible says? Yes. Now what are you going to do? Go by what the Bible says? Or go by how you think things ought to be? Again, I'm not mad at you folks. I'm just serious and making you do what you need to do when, you, when God's word confronts you. You can't set it aside. It's the word of God. It's alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And if you set it aside, it'll cut you to ribbons. Now look at verse 25. Then came she and worshipped him, and saying, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it is not meat, it's not fit, not right, to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. What's he using there? Some kind of a proverb that she can't understand, has no meaning to the situation? No. He's saying something that has an explicit application to the situation. There are two categories of people in his mind, children and dogs. Who are the children? Israel. Who are the dogs? Gentiles. Is that some new expression he's using? No, you can find the Old Testament full of that. What David called Goliath. What do you understand David called him? An uncircumcised dog. Because he was uncircumcised. The Gentile. This woman was not an Israelite. She was not a child. She was not a member of the children of Israel, the nation God begat on his own and of his own and for his own. They were dogs. Gentiles were dogs. That's what you would have were in time past as an uncircumcised, as one with a name uncircumcision applied to you. And the Lord's looking at this woman now. She's worshiping him. And he says, it's not fit, it's not right to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. That's what was being received by the children at this, at the, in the climactic stage of God's program in Israel. They were receiving food, bread, for their sustenance and nourishment to make it through that time out there and to have blessing in the kingdom with it. He says, not meat to cast it unto the dogs. It's not right to do that because the dog's time for getting any benefits are out there. But here's where that woman's smarts come in. I don't mean that in a clever sense. I mean that in a, in a, in a genuine uh, intelligent sense. She understood that and she submitted to it and she put herself in a, as a dog under the seat of Abraham and asked for a crumb. Not, didn't want the bread yet. She knew she couldn't get that yet. But she's, can I get a crumb right now? Verse 27, and she said, Truth, Lord. Ah, that's, there, there's her submission as a Gentile dog and she comes through the nation Israel. And a provision was for that in the law. And she avails herself of it. She didn't avail herself of that right at the beginning. She avails herself of it now. Truth, Lord, she says, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And there were some crumbs falling from the master's table all during that time. Because the children weren't eating it like they ought to have. 
Some were, but the majority weren't. So crumbs were just falling off that table. And she recognized that. She knew more of what was going on in Israel because she believed what, it's, what, what was going on. She believed who she was as a Gentile, viewed things from that perspective, as a Gentile dog in Israel's program. And the Lord says, verse 28, Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. When he says great is thy faith, he doesn't mean faith in just some, in just some uh, uh, quasi-meaningless manner, like people just say, have faith, brother. Faith's got an object, folks. Faith doesn't exist for faith's sense or sake. Faith's got an object. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And she just heard the word of God out of God's own mouth that confirmed to her and reminded her of what God had said all the time through Israel. That she's a dog. And that the Abrahamic covenant's blessing for her is out there when the king was established. She understood that. She said, that's the truth. I understand that. I fully believe that. And I'm not asking for that. I, I, I want, I want, can, can I have a crumb of what's going on right now? Because she also understood that the nation wasn't receiving it like they could have and should have. Great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. He did deal with her. But not because of dispensation of Gentile grace in effect, but because, and the woman's dog status never changed. Hasn't changed out there. The Lord dealt with her because she availed herself of a provision in that Mosaic law for dealing with a stranger who submits themselves to Israel. Now look at it one more time in Mark chapter 7. Same account, Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. Verse 24, And from thence he arose and went to the boards of Tyre and Sidon, and entered into a house, and would have no man know it, but he could not be hid. For a certain woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by nation. That, that's her exact pedigree. And she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. But Jesus said unto her, Let the children first be filled. For it is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it unto dogs. The reason why I want you to look at it again over here is because of that expression. He says, let the children first be filled. That is the issue once again. Gentiles would, were going to be dealt with in Israel's program. The program calls for it. Not dealt with in the dispensation of Gentile grace, but because God's program was for the blessing of the nations. But the children in Israel are going to be first filled. Then that takes place. The reason why I point that out once again is because that's what's going on in those great, great commissions. The children are first filled, then the dogs get dealt with. That's why he told him, you won't cover all the cities of Israel until I come back. Then you go out there and do it. As a look at the clock here, we, we're running away on time. What's running away on us, I guess. The other account in connection with the Gentile, we won't look at it, mention it to you there, the centurion. As a centurion whom the Lord heals, a servant of. But it's interesting, he comes, you look at the account, he comes through the mediation of the Jews, Israelites. And he had already blessed Israel, and they said he was worthy for it. He built them a synagogue. The Lord dealt with them on that basis. There's a provision, once again, for the Lord doing that. Israel's program provides for it and everything, but the issue of Gentiles has to come through the nation of Israel, because that's who the program's with has to recognize the dog status and come as a, 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 as a, a lowly, bedraggled dog and not one who is naturally worthy of it, as if God's dealing with the Gentiles. And the Lord makes that painfully obvious once again in everything he says and does, especially by his treatment of that Seraphonician woman. And like I said, you need to understand that. You need to appreciate that, and that ought to manifest itself to you, and clearly display itself to you as testifying to the reality of the fact that back in the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, this dispensation of Gentile grace was not in effect. 
And Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers, just like Romans 15.8 declares him to have been. Now, as I look at the t time here, uh, there's other things we could look at in connection with the reality of that. And, uh, and just saying that to you, there's the account over there in Luke's gospel in connection with the uh, two Greeks who came and wanted to see the master. They came to the uh, apostles there and said that they'd like to see the master. Philip and the other go over and tell them that he didn't deal with them. Sometimes people get the idea he didn't. There's no, no evidence whatsoever he did that. He didn't deal. In fact, he told Philip and the others the exact opposite. He told them what was going on in Israel's program at that time. And he reminded them of the fact that the time wasn't there yet for those Greeks to be dealt with. When you're back in the gospel accounts, therefore, circumcision, uncircumcision is a big issue. There's still a great difference. You got children and dogs, and they're not, and they're told not to go to the Gentiles. And when, when you're back in the gospel accounts, there, by no means could you ever say there's no difference in Jew and Greek. Big difference. Once again, I remind you of the fact that any time that difference exists, you know you're not in the dispensation of grace. Because one of the hallmark features of the dispensation of grace is both one. Circumcision availeth anything, doesn't avail anything, nor uncircumcision. There's no gift in Jew and Gentile. But that's only in the dispensation of grace. That middle wall partition is still up back here. But not in the dispensation of Gentile grace. Okay, let's introduce the second of the three issues we're going to be looking at in connection with the gospel accounts, and that's the issue of the gospel itself that's being preached. The message that's being preached once again at this time, as the Lord is, as, as, is preaching, as the twelve are preaching, that began to be preached by John the Baptist and so forth, is not a message about a new dispensation of Gentile grace. It's not the mystery of Christ. It's not the gospel of the grace of God. Paul said it was committed to my trust. But it's the message, once again, about the time for that prophesied and promised kingdom of heaven vested in the nation Israel. It's the message about the fact that the time for that to be established was at hand, and that was the good news. It's the gospel of the circumcision, that the God's program with them as the circumcised people and what the circumcision stands for is ready to get itself established. Let's introduce it. Come with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. And we'll see how far we get here in the few minutes we've got. Luke chapter 1. And I want you to look with me, if you would, at verses... Uh, pick it up in verse 26. I want you to realize what the angel Gabriel said to the Virgin Mary, not only about the role she would have as the one who would bring forth the Messiah and what God would do with her as the virgin she was in fulfillment of Isaiah 7, 14. But I want you to understand also what the angel Gabriel told her about the end result of this, why it's taking place at all, what it's all about in God's program with Israel. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. The sixth month there is Elizabeth's, her cousin, John the Baptist's mum's sixth month. To a virgin, a spouse to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name 
Jesus. All right, this is the Messiah issue once again. That's what's going to take place. And the conception, as, she, as he points out down in verse 35, is going to be from God himself. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. It's the Messiah once again. God's going to enflesh himself and lie of the seed of David, fulfilling the Abrahamic covenant, fulfilling Isaiah 14, 7, 14, and 9, 6, and 7, and everything through Mary as the seed of David. But I want you to be focused right now upon verse 32 and verse 33. That's not all Gabriel told her. Gabriel told her once again that when that event took place there, there's a goal in view of that. The reason why it's taking place is because of what the Davidic covenant is going to provide for in the outworking of God's program with Israel. And the goal of that thing is not to usher in a dispensation of Gentile grace. The goal of that thing is to get that kingdom out there. Which is what the Abrahamic covenant looks for. Verse 32, He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. By the way, that, that, the great concept there, he shall be great. Uh, we come along t and tell people they're great today for various things and everything. Oh, that's great, and, and you're great for doing that, and things like that. And of course, that word great can simply be used to, simply, to, to, because that's who Jesus is. He's God manifest in the flesh, and there's greatness associated with that because of his godness. But that's not simply the way in which it's being used here, because it says, He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. The greatness isn't so much associated with simply being the Son of the Highest, although it's not divorced from that. The greatness has to do with the fact that the greatness that God promised to the nation of Israel is vested in Him. God promised and covenanted with the nation of Israel to make them a great nation. But the issue of them being a great nation was not going to be achieved because of their own fleshly merits. So the law contract manifests to them. For their greatness was going to be associated with God's Jehovahness doing things for them and giving it to them by His grace. Their greatness is going to be associated with Jehovah's presence in and working amongst them. And that's what the covenant promising the Messiah is all about. It's the mechanics of God's Jehovahness providing for Israel to make them into the great nation for out there. And he shall be called great for that reason. I say that to you once again, though, because that's what, that's what it's all about there, but to underscore once again, that's what the program's all about. That's what he's here for. He shall be called great, and shall be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. That's what the whole thing's all about. That's what he's come for. He's come once again to establish God's kingdom in the nation Israel, and the message he's going to proclaim, and he's going to have the twelve proclaim, that John the Baptist is going to proceed in proclaiming, is the reality of that. That the literal, physical kingdom and throne of the, of the, of the Davidic covenant, the time for that to be established is, is arrived and just around the corner on the time schedule. The kingdom of heaven, will say, is at hand. You can't preach that message today, folks, and tell the truth. Because in the dispensation of Gentile grace, God's program with Israel is set aside, and the King of Heaven is not at hand today. And it's not your job or a Christian's job or the body of Christ to bring the kingdom. And regardless how many churches in your community are out there saying that and trying to do that, that's not the issue. That's not what God's doing today. That's Israel's program. They're the only ones that ever will fulfill it. And that's Bible robbery to take it and assume it for yourself. Okay, our time's up here. And the tape's going to wind up in just a second here. We're going to resume this next time, examine this passage a little closely if you would, read on down, examine the things John the Baptist's dad says, and we'll pick it up there and start examining the gospel of the gospels. Until next time. <laughs>